guys very much. Before I introduce Ron, I want to read three verses. Give us a chance to at least know and know that the Lord is God and quiet our hearts and uh, our minds before Him, confess and sins before Him. Um, Jeremiah 2, verse 11 says, Has a nation changed its God, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be all the heavens of this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So let's go before the Lord just quietly um, for a minute and confess where we have forsaken the Lord in any way and maybe let the competitors uh, win the day those broken cisterns that uh, we have hewed um, out. Let me give you a minute and then I'll uh, close this and, um, and we'll introduce Ron. Gracious Father, this passage is very convicting. I imagine it is to uh, most of us where we have uh, forsaken you at, at times and look for our satisfaction or our joy or um, possibly even our salvation in um, ourselves and other things in um, the world in some other way. And so, Lord, tonight uh, we just confess that uh, you are Lord, that you are the only one we can look to you that the Lord Jesus uh, is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through Him. And so this weekend we ask that your name would be uplifted, that you would use an rod in that way, and that we would be quick um, to confess our sins. When we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for that we're very, very, very great. So um, use this time now. Um, and make our hearts right for the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Coach Brown um, has made a big, a huge impact on countless uh, lives. Um, two things, I mean, there's uh, 200 things to, to say, but uh, I mean, a couple of these that I'd just like to share just briefly. Um, we were sitting with Coach Brown at an FCA um, gathering of some kind. I was with my mom. It seems like it's a long time ago, probably died 25 years ago. And uh, my mom, and she was leaving, and my mom were from Nebraska. She is amazing because she's my mom, but she is an ordinary of a person as a Nebraska farm wife. A, as regular, huge rewards in heaven for the way she served us. But she is a just a regular great lady, but there is nothing amazing about her. And she, as she had sat by Ron at this, and as she left, she said, Coach Brown just made me feel like I was the most important person in the whole building tonight. And uh, I just thought, wow, that, what a great compliment to be able to give um, Coach Brown. That's the way he operates. And then the other thing is, I at one point, Six million people in Nebraska. Eh, maybe not quite. That might got pets and everybody. <laughs> Something like that. I would think it might be a safe thing to say that God is our Lord has used Coach Brown. I would say possibly more than any other individual person since 1987 um, to impact lives. I don't know that there's been another person that the Lord's used in a greater way as he has traveled across the state numerous times uh, just all about the gospel. So, um, Coach, I'm so thankful for you. I'm really grateful that you would make the trek out here and we love you deeply. Thank you for coming to share with us. Amen. It's really an honor to be here with you guys again to see a number of you 
we were, we were here three years ago when I was here, and Jerry graciously invited me, and you all were gracious to me while I was here to um, listen. And uh, first of all, let me just say Jerry is near and dear to me. He's near and dear to many in Nebraska. The Christian community knows him, and they know of his faithfulness and his love, and I know you all do. Um, Amen. So I really, really appreciate him. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, there's going to be tremendous crowns for Jerry Edgar in heaven. Yeah. Tremendous. And I, you know, I'm going to be jealous of him in my life. <laughs> he will be, you know, God, God will use him. Because God has used him uh, to inspire many, many lives. So the only thing I'm trying to get him to do is to let go of all of the sin in his life, which, which is the hair follicles up there. Just let it all go. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it all <laughs> Real men go bald. It's <laughs> a double minded man, a double headed man, a full hair man. Thank you all. So, <laughs> hey, a few things, uh, guys, when I talk, talk tonight. I'm not like this real fancy speaker or anything. I'm just kind of down to earth. I'm a ball coach, um, like a lot of you all. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm a husband of 34 years. Um, I'm, uh, I'm 62 years old. I've been around the block a few times, but there's still so much more to know. When I read the word, I realize how little I really know. And yet, the Lord tells us to have an appetite for him, to feast on his word. In fact, <clears throat> we just had a great meal. Thank you for that. But I also say that uh, the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Jesus said that. When he was tempted with bread, he said, no, no, bread, no, no. The word of God. Every word. And uh, the average, uh, well, the Bible has about 780,000 words, I think. Some, something like that. Sure. Somewhere. 780,000 words. The average American adult, young adult, older adult, from what I've read, uh, reads about 1,400,000 words per year. So, really, you could read the Bible twice over if that's all you read. If you read like you do, your phones and everything else that we read, we would, uh, we would clearly have time to read the Word of God. If you read four chapters uh, uh, a day, you probably get through the Bible in a year. I talked to... Uh, one of my boy, buddies at a master's college, and one of the guys who helped lead me to the Lord, he and his wife have started reading the book of James together. Um, out loud, the entire five chapters, every day. Hmm. And he said, it takes 14 minutes, Coach. Hmm. 14 minutes a day. He said, my wife and I, we've just been exhilarated. And he's about my age, and he said, man, we have just been <clears throat> just reunited in our fellowship. And so, I just want to inspire you guys. How can you steward the 780,000 words that the Lord wants us to uh, dive into, eat, and have an appetite for? How can you steward it to the culture that, and the lane that God's put you in? How can you steward it to your wives? How can you steward the Word of God? Because, let's face it guys, we're men and we're called to do that. We're called to steward the Word of God to this culture. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, uh, I want to say some things that are going to be hard. And we're men. More importantly, we're brothers. And in family, you should be able to say anything. You really should be able to talk about anything. So uh, there's a few things I want to share as well. And, um, uh, I want to start with um, just a very brief uh, picture of it's something that happened in my life that's true. It's not my testimony, but it's a parable of my testimony. And what it means, to, I think, to be redeemed in Christ. This is a true story. So, <clears throat> I've never known my biological mother or father. I've seen pictures of my biological mother. My father was from another nation. My mother was from Tennessee. Uh, she went to New York City, was married to study music. She met a man who wasn't her husband, she was married, but evidently had relations with that man from overseas. 
uh, got pregnant. That was me in there. Um, about one month into her pregnancy, she tried to tell this man who was somewhere now in Germany uh, that um, uh, you have a uh, you have a, a child, and he didn't he didn't seem to be interested at all. So never heard from him. Anyhow, she delivered me, put me in an orphanage in New York City, um, took off with her husband to the West Coast, and they lived out there in Los Angeles until they both died um, in the mid '90s, and then early uh, 2000s, uh, from what I heard. I, uh, I, was in a, I was in an orphanage, I was a ward of the state of New York. Two people old enough to be my grandparents from the state of Massachusetts, had hardly any money, had hardly any education, didn't have anything, wanted children, went to this place, heard that there was a place there that had children. Somehow, some way, they selected me, brought me home. I was a foster child. They went back to New York City, got a little girl from the South Bronx. Uh, she was brought back, uh, and she was a foster child. And so one day, these two loving people said, we want to change your names. We want your name to be our name. Um, we no longer, you're, you're, not any, you're not Ronald Price anymore. You're going to now be Ronald Brown if you want to be adopted. And um, we want to make you ours. And so we were adopted. And everything changed. Name changed, food changed, friends changed, home changed, everything changed. And then uh, uh, some years later, they went, went uh, uh, had another boy from inner city Boston named Walter. And they brought him home and to our home. And he was a ward of the state of Massachusetts. And he was there with us for a little while. And then one day, one day, Walter and I got into a very serious fight. And it was a fisticuff brawl on the kitchen floor. My parents walk in. We're beating the tar out of each other. We're both guilty. We're both wrong. Uh, my mother says, one of you has to go. This can't happen anymore. We had been in odds for a while. One of you has to go. And so I put it out there for you. Which one has to go? Which one? Which of the two has to go? I mean, we that both new one. Who? A new child. Why? Also, you know, adopted. Right. That's right. The son gets to stay. The son gets to stay. The son gets to stay. Both killed. So Walter had to live. Walter eventually was killed, which was our fear. I look back at that and I go, it's not fair. Why did I get to stay and Walter, why did he have to leave? It's really not my business. There's only one thing I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't deserve it. Why did they choose me in the first place? Did I throw my little football at the orphanage for other than any kid? Did my pants smell any better than any other kid? No, I didn't earn anything. I didn't, I didn't deserve anything. I was chosen. Amen. Ephesians 1.5. If we come to know Christ as Savior Lord, the scripture says we've been like adopted. That's right. Predestined out of the Father's good pleasure. God out of his pleasure chose through Christ. Amen. Do you know Christ as your Savior Lord? You've been chosen. Are you kidding? You can say, why me? Why don't those people live in another part of the earth maybe they haven't heard the gospel yet? Or, or why not the kid down the street? Why did I get it? Why did somebody else? I don't know. Was it because you were better? Because you had something good about you? No. The scripture says, while we were in the midst of our sin, while we were in the midst of nailing Christ on that cross, He chose us. Why some and why not others? I don't know. Um, All I can trust is that God wants everyone. He's willing that a whole world repent. He wants no one to perish. God so loved the world, the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, the propitiation of our sin. He punished His Son for you and me, the punishment all went to him. If you just stop and think about that for a minute, you gotta go, oh my goodness. 
so that I would not perish, but have eternal life. So that you would not perish and you have eternal life. Do you realize what you fell into? Do you realize what happened to you without you doing anything to deserve it? There's only one thing you can do, really. There's only one response. Thank you. And our whole life, from this point on, ought to be one big thank you. I mean, everything we do. If you're a football coach, and I've met some of you, and I happen to touch the world I've lived in for a lot of years, every play ought to be a thank you to the Lord. Every moment on that practice field, if you're married, every moment with your bride, your children, at the job, at the most boring job you can imagine. No longer is the most boring job anymore when you're living like that. The job's not the problem. The problem is you and me. We're the ones who make it boring. Yep. So, I share that story because, man, there are countless Walters in the world. In fact, Jesus said the road is broad that leads to destruction. Many are on it, but the road is narrow that leads to life. Only a few are on it. Statistically speaking, most people don't just float up to heaven. Most people die and go to hell, statistically speaking. Jesus said that. We don't, we don't get the final say on that. <clears throat> but our way of responding is saying, thank you, and I'm going to intimately know Jesus and intentionally make him known. No matter what it costs. Amen. So I want to talk about appetite. I've seen players for years, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, dragging around, doing his laissez fair, moping around. And you go, why do some players have an appetite and they're all fired up? Why do others just mope around? Even some starting players. Because they can't see Saturday. They don't see their future. Why do we mope around sometimes? I'm not saying you do, but if you are. Grumbling, mumbling, groaning. It's because we can't see our, we don't see our, we can, we can see our glorious future if we see it through the eyes of Christ as we get to know this word. So I want to talk about that today. Uh, I want to talk about what, what's the expression of that look like. And uh, so I want to go, I want to get to a, uh, um, a PowerPoint. So where's my, am I controlling this or? Yeah, you got, you got, there you go. <coughs> And from time to time, you're going to hear from the, you're going to hear, I have a, my partner here who's going to read the word from time to time, yes. as I inform him. But let me ask you a question, guys. How many teams do you see out here right now? It's easy. Come on. Two teams. Two teams. Who said three? Three. Yeah. Uh, uh, the umpire. Who said three? The umpire. The umpire. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are three teams out here. Absolutely. There's three teams with three different uniforms. There's one team. There's two teams. The guy up here is on his team. The pitcher. There's a third team. Okay? Three teams. Home plate empire. I honestly believe that the role of the born again Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, is not this team, it's not this team, it's that team. I believe we're called to be the home planet. There you go. What? There you are. I think we are called to be the home planet empire. What's he doing right now? Bringing right. somebody else. Right. 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 here all the time. We're not supposed to judge people. <laughs> no, you're not supposed to judge unrighteous. We're going to talk. That's right. <laughs> but you have to make a judge. How many of you are married? Yeah, take a judgment. <laughs> you know, you, 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 know, you, know you, made, you made a judgment on that, right? We all did. Okay? And your job is you take. The church that you choose. We make judgment calls all the time. How we look at each other, how we evaluate one another, how we befriend one another, how we rebuke one another. And it's got to be a righteous judgment. It's a godly judgment. But I would contend with you that we are home <coughs> empires. We have to have the capacity to say, that's a ball, that's a strike. 
How many of you would like a home, man, home plate empire that favors that team? Or favors that team? You say, fire that guy. We don't want empires like that. We see enough of that in third grade basketball. Guys out there don't know what they're saying, what they're doing. They're blowing up. Okay. But see, the, the bottom line is that this man is supposed to be an objective viewer. He's supposed to be really good at what he does, and he's got to make a call regardless of what anybody else thinks. You know, I did some study on the home plate empire recently. I want to figure out, I want to find out, how do you become a major league home plate empire? And, man, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of, it's like 15 years. And it's the best of the best of the best of the best. They got to go to two schools, I think it's like two universities, Empire University somewhere, I don't know. And, and they go from these schools and they learn and they, they watch things, you know, on film and they, they study the, the strike zone and all that kind of stuff. And then, they, they, they graduate and they go to, well, the best of the best graduate and go to like triple A ball and then it's double A ball and it's one A ball and then, you know, again, they're just weeding out. It's just the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and then the, just a few that you crack through those filters end up in the major leagues and they, it takes like 15 years and it's a lot of study and they have to learn the strike zone. They got to know what the strike zone is. And those batters are, are clever. They're doing all kinds of stuff and, you know, they're messing around. <laughs> these guys, these catchers are doing all kinds of stuff with the ball. It, it can't just be, well, we studied on film and we've done it in the book, we've done our book knowledge. They got to go out there and they actually have to train with 100 mile an hour fastballs and curveballs and all kinds of things, doing crazy things that major league pitchers do. I mean, it's serious stuff. And, and, and these guys have to be very decisive on what they're doing. That's what we're called to do. The word of God. You're called to be a home plate empire in your home. On your job. With your children. In the country. You, you think, well, I'm, it's, our, it's us against these guys. No, it isn't. I don't believe that. I really believe this is what we're called to do. I'm going to dive into a little scripture and we'll We'll kind of get at that here in just a little bit, but I want you to think about something spiritually here, okay? First of all, even though there's three teams, there's still only two kingdoms and two kings. Who's this guy got an answer to? Anybody know? Who's this king? allowed himself to go to a cross to be punished, the Father punished the Son for our sin penalty. Okay? They don't, they don't understand that. Somehow, some way, thought about how many times they've been to church, how many times they've sang songs, or whatever. 
they don't understand truly what's happened based on God's word, what has happened to them in the, term, in the area of redemption. Unbelievers. There's also believers, okay, who are immature. Immature believers. And then the third group is mature believers. I think too many times we have said there's believers and unbelievers. Yep, believers will go to heaven and unbelievers will go to hell. That's true. But God is just not interested in who's going to heaven. God is interested if you're a believer, if you're in the camp of a believer, to no longer be immature. You can't be doing this as a believer anymore. We've got to pull the thumb out the mouth and grow. So I say there's distinctly three different groups here. And the, and, the, and, the, and the Bible really addresses it. Because a lot of the New Testament is written to believers and many of them who are immature. And, and guys, there is no excuse to be an immature believer. No more excuses. Absolutely no more. You cannot keep lowering the 10-foot rim down to 8 feet and say, well, I'm done. <laughs> that doesn't count. So I'm, I'm talking to myself, and I'm talking to us. Which category are you in? Are you an unbeliever? If you're an unbeliever, I'm hoping before you walk out of this weekend that you are a believer. Are you an immature believer? Are you a mature player? How can you tell? One thing that I think you can tell is that there's an incredible, incredibly growing appetite in a maturing believer. You may be new in Christ, you couldn't possibly be mature yet, but your attitude and your hunger is hungering and thirsting for God and His Word. That's a good sign. But, there's another sign, and that is the believer who's been a believer for a while, and that believer is the same, same spot. For what we call it, repeat errors. Can't be making the same, can't be living the same way as you did when you first came in. It's got to be growth. You've got to get off of milk and get on the meat. We ought to be, as it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, by now we ought to be teaching. But we're still, it says there, stuck on the elementary principles of the faith. We're still stuck on the very things that, you know, the training wheels that kids do when they first learn how to ride a bike. We still got training wheels on. Is that who we are? So, it doesn't sound pleasant, but I think we have to press into it. We talked the last time I was here about uh, James 1.8. James 1.8 is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Okay, I, I, I listen to those three categories. Okay? Of those three categories, okay, unbeliever, immature believer, mature believer, which category or categories could describe a double Minded <coughs> man. A double minded man could be in which category? Unbeliever. Somebody said unbeliever. Immature. 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 Okay? Alright. And we all kind of agree that a mature Christian is not double minded, right? That's kind of what we're saying. I would agree. I would disagree, but with the fact that a unbeliever could be double-minded. An unbeliever is single-minded. He's got one direction. That's all he knows. He don't know that he don't know. Right? The unbeliever don't know that he don't know. That's why he's an unbeliever. If he really knew, he would say, get me out of here. I'm coming to, to the king. Jesus. No, no, he hasn't left there yet because he don't know that he don't know. He's single-minded, 
He doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the mind of Christ, he doesn't have the capacity to do anything but the kingdom of this world. That's all he can do. So, the only people that really would fall into the category of being double-minded is the believer. And the immature believer is that double-minded man. Even in, 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 in uh, James 4, it says, purify your hearts, cleanse your way, you, you, you double-minded. James is talking to believers in that book. Amen. I mean, you look at all the New Testament books and the rebukes that Paul and, and, and the epistle writers and so forth give, it's about double-mindedness. It's about immaturity. It's about carnal. Uh, carnal Christians. So, uh, I didn't ask you to read this one, but could you turn to James 1, 22 through 25 and read that? I want you to listen to this. First of all, as he's turning to that, I want you guys to understand, and I had to learn this, I'm teaching this to, to our coaches right now, the book of James, we're going through that together, our football coaches at Nebraska, and man, I said, look guys, I, as I've been reading through this again, Man, it, this, is a, this is the Navy SEALs portion of the Bible. This right here, <laughs> we're not going to like this book. This is going to be hard because James is demanding. He said, listen, you've got to grow up. You've got to be mature. It's already happened. The persecution of the church, it's already happened. James 1-1, the scattered tribes, it says. Man, the enemy has come in and scattered these guys. And it said that now they're tempted, every man for himself. And James is trying to say, no, no, no. Hang in there, bro. You guys be mature. Be strong. Count it all joy when you go through various trials. Knowing this, the trial of your faith works patience or endurance. But let endurance have its complete work, that you may be complete. Lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. And then he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. And he won't hold it against you. <coughs> Let that, that man ask and be doubting because he's like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, tossed and turned. That man shall not receive anything of the Lord. And then back to verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. It's a book about maturity. So the key, a very key phrase here that I think is going to be kind of a premise for this empire ship that we're supposed to have that we're going to go through Want to read that for us? James 1.22 But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserve, perseveres, being uh, no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Okay. Um, you know, again, here's, here's, here's how Satan loves to work. I know, I know in football, we're sitting there talking to kids, and we've got to film up, and you're explaining something to them, and you only got a certain amount of time. You can't keep repeating yourself all day long. That kid better be taking notes. He better be listening. He better be zeroed in. He better be focused. He better understand what we're saying because we're fit to hit the field and it's got to be done in practice. And if it's not done in practice with the right technique, the right timing, the right synergy, the right chemistry, then on Saturday, it's a mess. And then we, get, we lose by inches. We lose by inches. People don't usually get beat. They usually beat themselves. I think oftentimes when the Word of God is being read, we beat ourselves right out the get drunk. Because we're not prepared to really do this. We're not really paying attention. We're so used to having somebody spoon feed us, spoon feed us, spoon feed us, spoon feed us. Sometimes there are, I, there are a lot of good books out there, and I'm not against books. But sometimes I think those books spoon, can spoon feed us so much that when the actual Word of God in its context is read, it's really hard to focus. So I, you, you almost have to train yourself, guys. I, I feel like I'm sounding judgmental, but I think I'm judging righteousness. I'm talking to myself, too. I do the same thing. Let me take a quick, just a quick time out to tell you something about training. I saw this on ESPN. Maybe you guys saw this. 
Coach K, Duke's basketball coach, was talking about the United States Olympic team that he used to coach. And uh, he was saying, you know what? I told the guys at the first meeting, he had a bunch of NBA guys with him a number of years ago. They were getting ready for the season play. He said, guys, if we're going to win the gold medal, two things have to happen. Number one, we're going to have to hit our free throws. Number two, we're going to have to hit standstill three-point jump shots. Young high school kid, fresh out of high school, Kobe Bryant, raises his hand. Says, Coach K, who does that? Who takes standstill three-point jump shots? We don't. We're always off the bounce. We're always going behind the pick. We're always stepping into it. We don't take standstill three-point jump shots. Coach K said, men, there are two things that you're going to have to do to win a gold medal. You're going to have to hit your free throws, and you're going to have to hit standstill three-point jump shots. He just repeated himself. Coach K said, that meeting ended, and Kobe Bryant went out to the gym, took a basketball, and, and proceeded to take 1,000 standstill three-point jump shots. Every day. Every day on the tour. Every day he did that. So I went out and messed around. It takes about an hour and a half a day to do that. An hour and a half takes about 1,000 standstill three-point jump shots. You think that that had some effect on that guy's accuracy? and that guy's talent, and helping them to win the gold medal, you bet it did. You see, that, that kind of mindset, even though that's a parable, I'm not, I don't know what Kobe's at spiritually, I don't know what Coach K's at spiritually. I'm using that as a modern day parable, that that is what we need to do in the Word of God. Amen. We need to repetitiously go through it, through it, through it, apply it, eat it, live it, eat it, live it, eat it, live it. Amen. Over and over and over again. So that our accuracy and our energy and our staying power is, becomes greater and greater and greater. It, it's not, well, some guy's got a gift of reading the Bible. No. If you can read, if you can read, you're in. You're in. Or if you can even hear. Back in the day, the slaves of America, they, they weren't allowed to read. Some of them couldn't read. But they heard the word of God. They kept hearing it over and over and over again. It was changing their lives. So you can discipline ourselves to do that. That's really huge in, in our growth. I want to read something to you uh, out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, I won't read the whole chapter, but if you get a chance, read the whole chapter. Read chapter 2, because I think it talks about being an empire. Being an empire. Here's what it says. Uh, I'm going to look at verse uh, 14 through 16. The last few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says this. But a natural man. Who's a natural man? Hmm? You a natural man? Unbelievers. Natural man. Unbelievers. Natural man. He's got the one birth. Come out of his mommy's womb. But the natural birth hasn't been born a second time. Hasn't been born again. Natural man. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Because he don't know that he don't know. That's what? And they said, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises, listen, all things. You, men, who are spiritual. You're born again. You trust in Jesus Christ and you say, look. You get to appraise all things. You get to judge all things. You get to discern all things. There's nothing on this planet that you can't look at and, and, and get a God perspective on. You have incredible power. We are the most powerful force on the planet. We are. It goes on to say this. Yet, uh, verse 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. In other words, there's nobody who's got the upper hand on you. Stop shaking hands with the enemy. Stop, stop compromising. Stop apologizing for your faith in Jesus Christ. Man, you got what it takes. You got it going on. The world needs what we have. They need to learn how to appraise things like we do. They can't because they're not spiritually equipped like you are. It says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? <laughs> no one. God doesn't need to be instructed. He says, but we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Let me ask you a question. 
Who has the mind of Christ? Who has the mind of Christ? We have the mind of Christ. Who's we? The believer. And, and the mature believer. The more and more and more and more and more you spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you take spiritual jump shots with Jesus Christ, the sharper your aim, you're going to know what to pray for. God's going to decipher all that junk in there about you. I bet you Kobe Bryant, when he went out there and shot, realized some things along the way. I got bad technique here. I don't have the same hang time on the 890th uh, shot. I've got to adjust some things here. Yeah, that's right. We have to get out there and work it, work it, work it. Over and over and over again. This is not easy stuff. But we have the mind of Christ. Man, we have the mind of Christ. That's why I'm sick and tired of Christian men. We just, we're not felt sometimes. Sometimes we're just like, ah, I don't want to hear about it from us. Yeah, they do. They need to. Amen. Whether they want to or not. Amen. Expert. My favorite empire. Back in the day. Way back in the day. 1965 or 66. He was the first African American major league home plate empire ever. Emma Dash. Great empire. Man, when he, look, he had a style about it, too. Now, I remember going to Fenway Park as a kid. Man, we'd be all watching all of us from our neighbors watching that. We didn't care about the game, man. We didn't care who was batting, who was pitching. We just wanted to see the home play of the It was our show. And man, we loved it. And when that dude called a strike, he called a strike. When he threw you out, he threw you out. When he called the ball, he made a big deal. So there's two things that I, that I learned from watching Emmett Patrick that I think apply to the Christian man today as a home plate empire and a culture. One, he's accurate. He studies to show himself approved. He's accurate. He knows the word of God. He's accurate. He's dead center bullseye. Are you accurate with the word of God? Am I accurate with the word of God? Please don't take what I'm saying here because I'm standing up here saying it. Go back, as it says in Acts, in the book of Acts, and study and see that these things be so. Go back and look through the Word, as the Berean Christians did back in the day. Don't just take people's word for it. There are so many false prophets out here, guys. It's unbelievable. I mean, you can't just say, well, that guy's a believer. He's on TV. He's in it. No. You've got to get through the Word, study, get a study Bible, test and see if these things be so, because it's deceit. In football, it's a play action pass. I used to be a safety in college. And, and you study, you study, you're looking at that tight end, you're playing quarters coverage, it's reinforced. If the tight end is blocking, you're up on the run. If the tight end is releasing, you're back on a pass. And your pass responsibility. Sometimes that tight end is blocking, and it's a stinking pass. <laughs> it, it's a play fake, the tight end is blocking, here I come, and there goes the ball behind me for a touchdown. Play action passes happen all the time to us guys. Play action passes, man. Deceit. So, you have to be accurate with the Word of God. And when you are accurate, the more accurate you are, just like Kobe Bryant, the more accurate he was, the more authoritative he was in taking that shot. You're going to have an authority about you. What are those guys in the, even those Pharisees and those Sadducees, back in the day when they said, Jesus, when they listened to him talk, they said, man, they marveled because he spoke with authority. Right. Do you speak with authority? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to give somebody space. My daughter's always, I grew up in a house with girls. I mean, not grew up, but I had a house with girls. And I go, Dad, use your inside voice. You know, so loud. <laughs> Sounds so mean. <laughs> but you guys know, we're men. We know that there are times, we have to have a level of authority. We have to be accurate and we have to be authoritative. That's part of being a good empire. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Anybody have an idea what's happening here? Jesus on trial. Yeah. Jesus on trial. Yeah. Who uh, who kind of orchestrated that trial? Who kind of had the you know the Pharisee? Pharisee. Yeah. And who was the? The, kind of the 
head on to of uh, 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 Pontius Pilate, right? We're aware of Pontius Pilate, okay? Did some research on Pilate, fifth prefect of the Roman uh, province of Judea, served under Empire, Emperor T Tiberius. Uh, he, he's the guy who conducted the execution, as we know, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, he was approximately, probably Pilate was about 45 years old, um, or so. And he died just a few years later. Probably died at around 50 years old. Okay, so uh, probably back then that was a decent age. I mean, a, a fairly long life, it wasn't extremely long. But you know, you guys, we guys are all kind of we're kind of in that age range where we're making a lot of decisions. And um, I want to I want to read Mark 15, 15 for me. So we kind of know the story of Pilate. He's getting ready. He's trying to ask him questions and so forth, and he's trying to see if he, you know, if Jesus really should go to the cross. And uh, he's talking to these guys, talking to the crowd. What's it say? Mark fifteen fifty. Here we go. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd released for them for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus he delivered him to be crucified say that again now you read that verse again so Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd stop so Pilate what wishing to satisfy the crowd so Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd 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 Boy, is that big news these days, huh? I mean, really, it seems like everybody's wishing to satisfy the crowd. Pilate had a chance to make a statement. Pilate had a chance to make a good decision. But wishing to satisfy the crowd. Well, you look at our politicians, and you look at our leaders, you look at our, you know, our coaches, you look at, I mean, everybody's just trying to satisfy a crowd. It's like, we want to get the numerical vote. That's what we really need. That's what we want. People are politicians. They play politics. They're not statesmen. Anymore. Man who's willing to stand alone. Are you a man that's willing to stand alone? You're going to be called into that account if you're going to be an empire. For the Lord Jesus Christ. Because guess what happens to empires almost every day? Boo! Boo! You stink! He gets called every name in the book. Uh, dear mom, wow. She probably hears it. She gets a lot of bad information too. Hmm. You have to stand alone. We've got to be willing to stand alone, guys. Man, I, oh gosh. Lord, I am so sorry. At times, I have not stood alone. Read Luke 23, 23 for me. This is another version. Mark 15, 15, and Luke 23, 23. Easy to remember. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. And their voices what? Prevailed. Their voices prevailed. That means they won. The voices won in the long haul. Are the voices winning in your life? All those voices out there? They go against what you really believe in. Are they winning? They won with Pilate. Hmm. A great empire must be willing to stand alone. Accuracy. Authority. Can you imagine an empire wishing to satisfy the crowd? <laughs> or allowing the voices to prevail? Well, I'm changing the call. The crowd was pretty loud on that one. We're going to go there. Okay. All right. Um, one other thing happens, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, for me turning to 1 Chronicles uh, 12.32, regarding accuracy and authority. We've talked about accuracy a little bit, a little bit of authority. Of Issachar, 1 Chronicles 12.32, of Issachar, men who had understanding of the time, to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs, all of their kinsmen under their command. So, these men from the tribe of Issachar, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of, them, one of the great things that they did really well, what they were known for, 
They were men who understood the times. They could discern the times. They could discern the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. They had wisdom and discernment. They could look at a situation and say, this is what Israel ought to do. See, an umpire has got to keep track. Not only does he have to know the strike zone and make the call, but that man also has to keep track of the batter's count. He's got to know. Is it 0 and 2? Is it 1 and 2? Is it 3 and 1? He's got to know what's next. It's going to happen. If he loses track of that, he doesn't know what's happening next. He doesn't know what to do. That's a demand on us. Do you know the culture? Do you know your culture around you? Are you so sharp with the Word of God? And are you, are you now perceptive of all the stuff that's happening around it that you're able to say, hey, that's a ball, that's a strike, that's a ball, that's a strike, I received that, I, I reject that. That's what we got to be. That's what you and I got to be. I think sometimes, man, we just kind of, we're like that, we're the pinball in the pinball machine. Bing, bing, bing. We just bounce. We just bounce around wherever where we bounce, as if we. Well, that's just part of God's sovereignty. Well, part of God's sovereignty is you and I making righteous judgment. Be a great empire. Okay, next picture. Ah, okay. North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina. You guys are familiar with that, right? Oh yeah, Floyd's barbershop. I remember I was a kid used to watch. It'd be very hard for you guys are too young for that. <laughs> Hoover, Barney, Floyd, Andy, I don't know who he is, but anyhow. Alright. Okay, barbershops are places where people make uh, yeah, they make a lot of judgments. They kind of solve the problems of the world. You know what I mean? I'm thinking in this barbershop. OJ's guilty. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he ain't got a fat chance. <laughs> okay? Next barbershop. I'm thinking in this barbershop, OJ's innocent. <laughs> now, why would I say that? Am I trying to put a fight here? <laughs> You know, one thing about an empire is that he can't be favoring a side based on things that men divide over that have nothing to do with the spiritual condition that's, that's, that needs to be addressed. Right. And it's so often that we're making decisions based on our race, our geographic, where we're from, our social economic status, our political affiliation, and we're not calling balls and strikes anymore. Now that preacher throws the ball, everything is either a strike or a ball, depending on which side you're on, Mr. Empire. Mr. Empire. How are you making these decisions in life? How am I making them? Next question. A lot of churches look like this. Next question. A lot of churches look like that. Right here in America. We've become very divided. I just use the race example. Not trying to pick on anything, but it's pretty identifiable now, mm -hmm. even in the church. And, you know, it's interesting, in the book of James, it, it says, uh, and you want to you read, are you, uh, are you there? You want to yes, read, sir. would you read James 1, 17 through 21? Yes. Listen to this now. Listen to what James has to say about this. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of His own, Will he, of his own, will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant, and rampant, rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I had a good talk with a guy named Benjamin Watson, who's a place with the New Orleans Saints tied in. Uh, he's a Fox News correspondent, conservative, black, like myself. Uh, we had an interesting talk. We talked about this, this ball strength thing and how and if you look at Fox News, if you look at CNN, you're going to get just one side of it in case. And if you go into one church versus another church, or one barbershop versus another barbershop, you're going to get one or the other. But is there anybody out there, is there anybody, any one of us, who are quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? And the world is going to treat, they're going to, they're going to run off and do crazy things with this. But we, we ought to be different. Amen. So, it may not be just a race issue. It may be um, how you see things at home with your bride. 50% of the marriages in the Christian community are, are ended and divorced, divided, people are gone. I'm not here to judge every divorce. I do know this God hates divorce. Amen. He said it. Now, um, and I know people may have different stances on, on it. On it. There, there seems to be a permissible uh, place for divorce under right conditions, but quite frankly, you, we all know that it's, there have been multiple reasons that don't even apply to the scripture why people are taken off. I look at the players that, that I'm coaching, and I would say probably 80 percent of them come from homes um, where the father particularly has left. And we see the following of it. The Bible says in Malachi that when a man divorces his wife, it's like he covers her with violence. I had a former player who was insistent on leaving his wife. And uh, I said, hey, son, um, Particularly the reason you're telling me, huh, there's no, there's absolutely no biblical justification for it whatsoever. I said, you know what, man, you brought her into this world. I said, what are you talking about, coach? She's not my child. I said, let me tell you something, bro. I said, you were 21 years old. And you sat in my office. You played for me way back there in the 1980s. And you said, coach, look at that volleyball girl. You see that volleyball girl? Such, such, such? He said, yeah, I don't know. She, she, he said, I'm going to ask her out tonight. I'm going to date her. I'm going to go out. She's a Christian like me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they dated. They got married. They have three children who are now high school and college. And then just a few years ago, he, it's just a, it's very bad. And I told him, I said, you know, you brought her into this world. He said, Coach, what do you mean? I said, you... She was minding her business. She was just, she had her own last name. She, she was just doing her thing, playing volleyball, going to school, and you interrupted her life. For the better, she was excited about it, but you interrupted her life. You changed her life. Then you married her. She was just an, a regular woman, now she's a wife. Then you put babies in her. Man, you brought her into that world. She took on a life of her own, so to speak, because of you, the way God set it up. And now you're walking out. You might as well be walking out on your children. You're walking out on your wife. And in the book of Malachi, God addresses that. He's saying that's why you're not being blessed the way you should be blessed. Like I said, I don't even know who I'm talking to. I have no idea. It's probably the best way to have a speaker who doesn't really know who he's talking to because sometimes you say things and, and I, I'm trying to be an empire. 
I almost walked out on my wife. Almost left her. I'll tell you, guys, <coughs> I had to, I had to go before the Lord. Just the notion of that painting, I repent. Just, just, just the notion of that painting, I repent for. That is a non-negotiable. That is a, that's, that's always going to be a ball to the Lord. So, it's a variety of ways that we are breaking fellowship with that which God has called us to stay in fellowship with Him over. So, uh, I want to close it here um, uh, with something, and it's called the Royal Law. It's in uh, James Chapter 2, verse 1, um, it starts off. It says, Brethren, do not, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren, you Christians, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. I won't read the rest, but it goes on to say, you know, you're clearly treating people like one is more important than the other. That is not right. How many times have you done this? I'm guilty. How many times are you talking to a, quote, nobody? You're talking to a nobody. Nobody would recognize that guy. You're having a good conversation with him. And then a somebody comes in and just stands there. And all of a sudden, you go from nobody to somebody, like a robot. I say that all the time. It sure hurts when you're the nobody. But even when you're the somebody, you realize that I don't know if I can trust this dude. He's got an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, this is, this is what God says about that, at, at that attitude. He says, he says, if you look at verse uh, uh, 8, it says, if you, however, are fulfilling the royal law According to the scripture, the royal law is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which always starts with to love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. It says, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, or if you show prejudice, based on whatever it is, the barbershop, the skin color, the political affiliation, if you're showing that kind of stuff because you want to walk out on your family just because everybody else is doing it, if you're showing partiality for the wrong reasons, you are committing sin, God says, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now listen to what he says. For whoever keeps the whole law and, and, and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. Now look what he says. Look what he equates this stuff to. For he who said, do not commit adultery, and said, do not commit murder, now if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Listen to what he's saying. He's basically saying, look, yeah, adultery, we think, we got our technique. We say adultery, we must be. You say murder, yep, that's big. Ooh. But what he's trying to say is, hey, if you break one, you've broken the other, basically. You've broken the whole thing. You've broken the whole law. But partiality is in that equation. And he does not give us permission for it. The consequences aren't as bad for partiality because it always can stay hidden. You can have and I can have a hidden agenda all the time in these areas. But if you're really going to mature, if we're really going to mature, Turn that over to the Lord. So I don't know where you're at politically. I don't know where you are racially. I don't know where you are with your with your family. I don't know where you are with other people. I don't know where you are with all kinds of things that you could hide in your heart in partiality, partiality, prejudice. But it would be a good exercise to dump it all on the floor tonight and say I, I repent, because God's not going to be able to use you. Brother. You won't. You won't use it. You will not use that. No, you're still on the team. You don't lose your salvation. But you can't fully use it. It's like a player who's 
just keeps making repeat errors. A player who just doesn't try hard, a player who's going to be lazy, a player who's going to do his own thing, going to do his own technique. You're, not, you're just not going to play that guy very much. If you do, it's going to cost you. Last thing, we'll call it a man. Um, I, uh, response to prejudice or impartiality. What's our response to that? My dad, uh, the man who adopted me, Arthur Brown, um, before I was born, went to World War II. <laughs> How about that? Young, teenager, late teens, goes to World War II. Uh, he's fighting uh, Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. He's over in North Africa. He's in what they call segregated troops. Back in those days, in World War II, before Harry Truman desegregated the troops, the troops were segregated. So black soldiers only fought for black soldiers. They had white officers in every grade. They could never become officers, but they had to fight um, just in one racial group. And they were kept separate from the whites. So these men fought their guts out. They gave their lives on enemy soil in racially segregated troops. They came back to America. My dad shared this with me. He said, I went down to Georgia. <clears throat> he said, uh, we brought back German POWs. We sat in a restaurant. And in the restaurant, the German POWs got to sit at the counter, but all the black soldiers had to sit in the back. And he said, it angered us. It angered us because we fought for America. We're Americans. We fought proudly for America. We brought the enemy in. And they treated the enemy with more respect than they treated us. Now here's what my dad said. My dad said, doesn't matter. We love America. We salute America. Our hand goes over our, our heart all the time in the national anthem. We stand. We love America. We fought for its freedom. And even though it doesn't respect us the same way, we respect this nation. He was a member of the VFW, and I saw that man and his fellow soldiers pay tribute to America every time America was addressed. The National Anthem, Pledge of Allegiance, you name it. <coughs> so today, in the world that I live in, college football, or in the NFL, more so in the NFL, you have the issue of whether you stand for the national anthem or not. And I wanted to bring this up because I thought, hmm, I don't know. I talked to Watson about it. We had some interesting talks about it. I, I came to this conclusion at the end of the day. Right, wrong. I know some of you probably would have an opinion about it. And believe me, I had a dad who fought in World War II. I, myself, always choose to stand. I, I do. That, that's me. I don't think the scripture necessarily addresses it perfectly. I realize that there are other issues that are drawn, drawn in. We're supposed to honor our nation. But you know what? Here's, here's what I, I see. We're so concerned about whether some African American athletes stand up or not for their nation. But here in the land of the free and the home of the brave, for, as Christian soldiers for Jesus Christ, we don't stand for the gospel That's right. in the public square. Amen. We don't stand for it. We sit down all the time for it. We don't hold each other in account to that. That's right. So why are we so concerned about patriotism for America and so unconcerned about the gospel here in America. That's good. Amen. Make America great. Yes, I love to see America great. But how can America be great? Honestly, do we consider ourselves a great nation? Would, would we consider Germany in the time of Adolf Hitler a great nation? Murdering, exterminating millions of people. Would, would we consider Idi Amin in Africa or, or, or in the Middle East? Would we consider those great nations? No, we wouldn't, I don't think. Bloodshed. Dis dishonor to God. But here in America, we're saying we're a great nation 
when, when we have violated at the very core the most foundational institution that God created called marriage. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. As a nation, we violated it and said, we no longer believe that. Not everybody, but as a nation. That's what we've said. And we've executed 60 million little ones in the womb yes, since gone. 1973. Right. Which is the greatest holocaust in the history of the world. Can't tell. It's up there. It's up there. So I go, well, let's make Jesus great in America. Amen. Let's stand for him. Amen. Amen. See, it's very easy to get on a slogan. It's very easy to, to kind of go with the, the crowds, wishing to satisfy the crowds. But what I'm asking you and me to do is pull away for a minute. We have the mind of Christ. How would Jesus approach this? What would he think? Render to Caesar those things that are to Caesar, and render to God those things that are to us. That's right. Let's make sure that we're rendering to God what is God's. His honor in the public square has not been honored by Christians. We've sat back and we've watched the bloodshed, and we watch it every single day in this country. And we think, well, a woman got to stop making these decisions. Guess what? We're called to steward our females. We're called to steward this land, Christian men. Me included. So that's my uh, editorial. I, 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 I threw it out there because I want you guys to think through some things yourself. Not just about going to church, we're doing a Bible study, we're memorizing a little bit of scripture. How do you apply that, as it said in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, how do you apply that into the world that you're in? How do we become doers of the word? How can we really be felt with this word of God that we're responsible for across the culture? How can we be men like Essekah who could discern the times and know what America ought to do? Any questions? Any disagreements? Any thoughts? Please feel free, man. Don't. Don't. Like I said, we, we're here together. I don't have all the answers. I'm just, I just happen to be the speaker. But I want to speak with the authority of the scriptures. Amen. There weren't a lot of lovely things I had to say. I know that. But um, as we break up into our huddles and so forth, uh, whenever that is, uh, maybe there's some food for thought or things that we can share about. Or maybe when you go into your room at night, would have you to think through those things, uh, see if these things be so. Again, the bottom line is, I, I think we're called to be empires. I, I think we're called to be have, have the mind of Christ. I think we're called to make sense of this mm -hmm. world to the little children, and the ladies, and the animal kingdom, and the non-believers, and the immature believers. I think it's mature believing men that are called the whole high flagship of stewardship. Let me pray. <laughs> Father, um, I'm, I'm, I'm convicted myself, Lord, because I see the holes in my own armor. I see the bag of holes in my life. Um, but I've seen your grace. I've seen your... I, I've seen just your response to repentance, Lord. Um, thank you. Father, we just... We want, we want to thank you choosing us, first of all, and deciding that you were to call us son, that you would bring us into your home, that you would take us off the streets of this horrific orphanage and just spit us out, satanic live, and that we would follow King Jesus. A new kingdom, a new king. And Father, we're called in a very difficult, dark uh, eight-man box, Lord. We're called the tough sledding. We're called to, to, through trials and difficulties and persecutions and regrets, we're called to not just join in with the crowd and look for the easy way out. We're called even at times to stand alone. We're called to say things sometimes that are unpopular. But most importantly, Father, we're called to study your book, study your word, so that we are accurate and authoritative, Lord. 
but that the Holy Spirit would empower us in love with a non-negotiability to see your kingdom advance, to see the chains move. So, Father, I just pray for that. I pray that we would uh, allow that to uh, penetrate our hearts, Lord, and that we would literally become doers of the word and overflow of that kind in a special way of saying thank you. Thank you for all you've done for choosing me, Lord, choosing us so that we can go out and be ambassadors for you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Give us a great night. Amen. 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 Thank you.